I'm Curtis Knight, Executive Director of California Trout and your host of the Fishwater People Podcast. We're here with Damon Goodman, Mike Belchek, and Gareth Plank for what I'm sure will be a great conversation. So for some quick background information on how we're all connected. In June of 2023, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, was signed to formalize this partnership between our respective groups, Cal Trout, the Yurok Tribe, and the Farmer's Ditch Company with the objective of restoring salmon habitat and improving on-farm water use efficiency in the main stem Scott River. But it's no small task to reach an agreement like this. There's so many things to consider between environmental degradation, water curtailments, and the concerned members of multiple communities. And there's a lot of history behind the why and the how of this agreement. So let's get into it and start by learning about the region where this is taking place. Okay, well, I'm here with Damon Goodman. He is our Shasta Klamath Lassen Regional Director. So he runs our program in this important part of the North State. And Damon, I think it'd be important as we start here to kind of give everybody a context of the Scott River, kind of where it is. Everybody's got dam removal on their mind. Um, We've done a lot of work in the Shasta River right next door to the Scott River. So maybe set the geographic context of of the Scott River and, and why it's so important. Yeah, here we are in the Scott River, one of the major tributaries downstream of Iron Gate Dam. In the lower river, we're in like a class four gorge, right? With rugged rapids and steep terrain. And then you come up into this beautiful valley that's surrounded by wilderness peaks. And, you know, this is a a river that's something like 85% privately owned and also a hub for production of coho salmon and 10 other uh, native fish species in the drainage. So it's a real special place for fish, for agriculture, for people. And uh, yeah, Klamath Dam Removal is definitely on my mind too, being up there touring the dam removal sites about a week ago, seeing drawdown, seeing a natural flowing river, seeing the river take shape on its own. And and thinking about reopening over 400 miles of habitat above those dam removal sites. And and part of that is, you know, what fish are going to recolonize those habitats? Where is the source of those fish is going to come from? And so having functioning tributaries in proximity to that, you know, rivers that feed into the Klamath and their fisheries are so important for ensuring the success of the fisheries in the Klamath and the success of that restoration effort. And the Scott River is one of the primary tributaries to the Klamath and a source of wild fish. There's no hatchery, there's no dams. Uh, this is a spot where wild fish still live and will will set the stage for the success of this, this monumental restoration effort in the Klamath. Yeah, it's pretty cool how the Scott River flies under the radar as far as the number of coho, adult coho that come back. I mean, it's a couple, often it's a couple thousand fish each year, which like compare that to other watersheds for coho in the state. Who's, who's up in that list? Well, the neighboring drainage in the Shasta were, were less, less than a hundred, right? I mean, this, this is a species that's listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act and constantly being reviewed for being upscaled in that um, risk. Right. And so to have a functioning river uh, with those wild fish is just really something where we can, can protect the best that they have and, and support its restoration to what it historically was, which is much more than even the thousands of fish it has now. Right. Speaks to the opportunity that's there. It's there a little bit here and there, some years better than others, but boy, the opportunity exists. And and I think one thing to underscore about the Scott Valley is just it. There, there's a lot of people that have been thinking about how to solve some of these really big problems here. And joining now are Mike Belchek and Gareth Plank. Thanks for joining us and welcome to the Fishwater People podcast. This is exciting. This is the first time we've had three guests on. So it's a, it's a crowded room, but really excited to talk with you all because we got in the room today a set of diverse interests. And that's something that Cal Trout really talks a lot about is how do we work with diverse interests? coming together to solve hard problems, hard water problems. And I think this project and the work that you all are doing in the Scott River is a great example. So 
I'd love to just introduce everybody to who we have here. And maybe we'll start with you, Mike. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Michael Belchick. I'm a senior water policy analyst for the Yurok Tribe. I've been working for the Yurok Tribe about 29 years. And the Yurok Tribe is uh, 6,800 tribal members uh, located down towards the mouth of the Klamath River, just south of the Oregon border. And the tribe's interest is fish and fishing, cultural values, landscape scale restoration, uh, and I'm proud to work for them. Yeah, Mike, great to, great to have you here. At 29 years, I didn't realize it was that long, but I'm thinking about like, I've known you for 20 years. So it's uh, that's amazing. That's quite a run. And obviously, Yurok Tribe, one of our biggest partners over the years, and especially right now, so many cool projects. Mike, thanks. Thanks for joining today. And Gareth Plank, why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Gareth Plank and I ranch at Scott River Ranch and the current ranch that we are on, it's it's a little more than a hobby ranch. This one is uh, six square miles and the neighboring ranch, which we also have, adds, brings us up to a full 10 square miles of ranch with multiple miles of the main stem of the uh, the Scott. So that puts us pretty well involved in what's going on in the, in the uh, ranching and the river here. And as a uh, rancher, I'm at the terminus of the farmer's ditch. So I have eight neighbors and we divert water directly out of the uh, Scott River past the fish screen to uh, irrigate our fields and our, our crops. That's great, Garrett. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. Mike, you know, talk a little bit about maybe in relation to Klamath Dam removal. Well, that's happening right now. We're all really excited about that. Talk about the Scott River proximity to that, importance, how it ties into that whole effort. Well, I, I think it's really important to understand the Yurok tribe's approach to restoring the Klamath River. Uh, when I started the mid nineties, our charge was really simple, restore the Klamath, bring back the fisheries. Uh, but the Klamath is an incredibly ecologically diverse river. Uh, it ranges all the way from temperate rainforest at the mouth, uh, all the way up to its beginnings in the high mountain deserts of uh, Southern Oregon. And so each one of the tributaries is unique. Uh, think of them like family members. You have, you know, Weird Uncle Joe, you have Cousin Shirley, and and each one of them is really important to the family. And the Scott River is no different. The Scott River uh, is an incredible coho stronghold that's uh, further inland than all of our coastal coho stocks. Uh, the Scott River used to have a lot of lamprey, lamprey eels, which are really important to the tribe. And so when we look at restoring the Klamath River as a whole, you have to think about each tributary. And so when you zoom into the Scott, which, you know, uh, I think of, it's like a, a little piece of Montana located in California. It's stunningly beautiful and capable of being a real big fish producer. Uh, when you look, when you zoom into each watershed, each one has its own special challenges. It has people that care for that place in their own way. And each one has different solutions that present themselves to solving these problems. Yeah. And the Scott, the Scott Valley, I mean, it is, a, it's an amazing place. Damon described the canyon. You come up out of the Klamath River, up this beautiful canyon, and then you come to this valley, the Scott Valley. And Gareth, the Scott Valley, I mean, it's, it's an amazingly productive agriculture area, right? I mean, tell us a little bit about the Scott Valley, the agriculture, what's going on there? Sure, I think that's really a, a, an exciting part of what's going on here, Curtis. I'm what's known as a first generation rancher. So a lot of my neighbors, they're great grandfathers who I am. I'm the guy who you know headed out from uh, Missouri out of independence and decided to head west and start new and drag the family along. I spent about seven years looking for a ranch. And the reason that's important is Exactly what you're saying, and Damon and, and Michael, it is an exceptional place. And when I, you know, elected to move here, is because of all those great attributes. And one of the things that makes Scott Valley unique is we have about 750,000 acre feet of water go through here a year, and there's only about 38, 40,000 acres under cultivation. So it has the potential to be an extremely sustainable agricultural network and viable place to raise families and grow great food. And one of the things we found out too is that we have a lot of fish here and with partnerships that we're looking at between Caltrout and Yurok Tribe, we think we can bring the three together and have fabulous agriculture, spectacular scenery, great habitat, and everybody can go away looking at uh, a better world as we move forward. So from an agriculturalist standpoint, I think this is a fabulous place to, to ranch, raise a family, and coincidentally, uh, a great place to uh, help 
salmon spawn. Yeah, that's that's great. That's I think that sets the stage really nice. Well, Damon, kind of catch us up on on what some of these issues are out here. Maybe even take a little step back in this Scott Valley. I mean, Mike touched on the the coho stronghold aspect of it. I think it's really important to understand how many coho are produced here, even right now, how far they come from the ocean inland is pretty cool. Talk a little bit about the fish, talk a little bit about Beaver Creek, Beaver Valley, and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I've been thinking about coho salmon across California, and I think the Scott River may have the the most coho salmon produced per mile of any river in California. Now, uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong there, but this is really a hub for production for them because as they get up out of the valley, these wilderness streams produce just good quality water year round, great rearing conditions for them. And they have a safe place to be once they get up off that valley floor into these spots. And so th this is a long way from the ocean. Um, and so uh, anyway, that's just a, it's just a really important spot for coho, but coho are listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act in the Klamath Basin. And so that's really important that we focus on their conservation and, and, and bringing them back here in, and promoting their success in the Scott Valley. But we also have other species like Chinook, steelhead some beautiful steelhead you can hook into in that lower canyon uh pacific lamprey and others that all call the scott river home and so it's important when we take a look at restoring the scott we're looking at the whole ecosystem approach right to to benefit all these species and and that's kind of that that's the approach with this project that we're taking and just a little bit of step back into the history one of the names that the scott river was given was the beaver river and the scott valley was beaver valley until gold was discovered and then it turned from the trappers taking beavers out of there the hudson bay trapping company taking beavers out of there and then it became extraction for gold you know the scott river was actually named after a miner that found gold it, in the in the scott river john scott and you know that led to you know substantial mining from the bottom of the river almost to the top um and what started in some of the tributaries moved downstream into the main stem at what we call the mine tailings reach where this large-scale dredge uh worked for decades and they actually constructed dams across the river so that the dredge could be floated and go from valley edge to valley edge dredging down to bedrock and disturbing the soil and leaving behind four and a half miles of tailings that are something like 30 feet tall, right? I mean, the amount of material is just unbelievable until you go stand at the base and look up at these things. Uh, and so the scope and scale of that problem is so substantial that we've known it's an issue for over 100 years for our fishes and haven't had the support, the capabilities um, to be able to take on a problem of that scale. And, and here we are at the cusp of making substantial progress in a short period of time on that issue. That's just a little bit of the background and some of the issues that we're addressing in this Farmer Stitch project uh, kind of relate to that history and the legacy that it's left behind. That paints a good picture of the scale of this thing. This is a big, big eyesore on the whole huge stretch of the Scott Scott Valley. And then the Farmer's Ditch. I mean, what is the Farmer's Ditch? Yeah, let's talk about the Farmer's Ditch. That is a point of diversion that's in that mine tailings reach. And so that's a single point of diversion that was established as a ditch company in around the mid 1800s, around 1870. Um, it was actually initially uh, part of the gold mining uh, and then they converted it into a water transport for an open ditch. But the, the Farmer's Ditch Company is a conglomeration of nine different landowners. The ditch itself is something like 12 miles long um, and serves as something like 1,200 acres of irrigated uh, lands within that ditch company. And so we have a lot of different uh, practices and 
approaches to farming and ranching that go on in that 12 and a half mile stretch. And something like 30 to 36 CFS of water. So it makes that one of the largest water diversions, one of two large water diversions in in the Scott River. Right. So Mike, I mean, you, you, you know, this is a valley that's very different. So the challenge is how do you how do you try to put it back together? Can you talk about some of the ideas that are that are being considered here? Maybe give us a little more insight into just how the main stem Scott Scott River has changed over time. I want to step back a little bit too and talk about how the York Tribe approaches landscape scale restoration. Um, from the beginning of the Yurok Tribal Fisheries Program, so you know the Yurok people are as old as time itself. You know they've been there since the beginning. The Yurok Fisheries Program, however, has only been around since the mid to early 90s. Um, and from the beginning, we've always approached things by looking at like, what is the true problem here? And what are the tough issues to tackle? Whether it's dam removal, large scale restoration, the upper basin, water issues, uh, Trinity River issues, and the Scott River is no different. And when we started taking a look at what's going on in the Scott River, there was two things that really stood out. One was the flow management and the the water flows, especially in the fall. And the other is the overall geomorphic condition of the channel. So it went from being Beaver Valley with a relatively undefined channel that spanned across and moved frequently across the bottom of the valley to being channelized by various entities, uh, including the Army Corps of Engineers. But it, the really tough spot, the biggest spot to deal with is the tailing section in the upper part of the river. And if you talk with anybody, uh, there's a lot of people who really care about the Scott River. There's a lot of people that have worked for decades uh, trying to restore this. And the tailings have stood out as looking like a nearly intractable problem. Uh, you know, gold Yuba dredgers took the uh, alluvium on the valley all the way down to bedrock and churned it upside down, moved the channel over to the other side. Um, you can see it on Google Earth. I mean, you can, you can, yeah. it's easy to see. Yeah. So, you know, in keeping with our approach to things, we're going to zero in on the hardest and biggest part of the problem and try to work on that. And that's, that's what guided us in our approach and led us to meeting, uh, uh, forming a partnership with Farmers Ditch and Caltrout and uh, Water Trust and others. And I'll, I'll let Gareth uh, pitch in here, I'm sure. Yeah, some contributions here. Yeah, Gareth, tell us about where your land is in relation to the tailings and 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 what got you going on all this. Boy, everybody has the long backstory. So I like you know, I'd want to say that I'm at the Epic Center, but I'm not. Our, our ranch is a combined ranch is about ten square miles. We have a, a few miles of the Scott River, the main stem, right in the heart of Scott Valley, and the tailings are just to the south of us. And we belong to a ditch organization, which we're here for, the Farmers Ditch which owns land and diverts water from the Scott River at the uh, edge of the tailings. And one of the things that's occurred in, you know, in the multiple three decades or nearly that I've been here and working on the Watershed Council and doing lots of work, everything kind of comes to a standstill when you come to the tailings. There's four miles of basically a dead river, a river that's been, uh, for a, a lack of a better term, basically turned upside down and denuded of any vegetation or opportunity for fish to move through it and, and aquatic habitat. And so, hey, when I when I look at this ranch, it's, you know, what does it have to do with the tailings? Well, if the tailings aren't healthy, the fishery is not as healthy, and that puts pressure on ranchers. And so, you know, we can look at what's going on with the dam removal and what's going on with the uh, the Yurok tribe and folks such as Caltrop trying to, um, you know, make sure that there's healthy fisheries out there and or we can try to fight it, or we can say, this is really a golden opportunity for us as farmers and ranchers to work in concert with organizations that are deeply committed to the health of the ecosystems and these communities and, and make it for an opportunity for us. So within this project, there's going to be opportunities for in-stream restoration as well as to help us ranchers be more efficient with our water. And that means more profitable. One of our greatest expenses and greatest risk is water conveyance and availability. And so if we can have a healthier river system uh, I think we we're, we're all go away and said this is a, a wonderful wedding 
And it wasn't an open bar where we all walk away regretting it. It's one where we have a great big toast and dance into the night and uh, are much more profitable and, and healthy afterwards. I like it. You're teeing up a party. Always. That sounds good. Well, I've been to your place. It's a fantastic place for a party. Um, and and in fact, we we had a little celebration about this group coming together out there on your ranch. It's a it's a beautiful spot. Maybe it's helpful though for people listening. What's the setup look like? How do you irrigate your land and how does it affect and impact the river or or how does all that work? Describe the plumbing. One of the things, you know, they never, never, never give, uh, you know, a rancher a mic. We spent all our time driving in circles, doing two miles an hour, no neighbors. So gosh, I got an audience. We, we get a chat now. You know, I'll just sort of start. I used to think I was a, a rancher and then I thought oh, I was really sophisticated, I became a grass grower. And getting back to the issue of irrigation, I really found out that what I'm really doing is I'm husbanding the soil. And so if you don't have soil, you can't hold water and grow things. So you need healthy soil. So in order to grow things, we not only have to uh, convey water onto the ranch, and this ranch is very unique that we actually use some of the most sophisticated methods of conveying water. We have center pivots, which are highly efficient, all the way to flood irrigation. And I know, you know, here I am in front of a uh, tribal biologist and cow trouts talking about um, flood irrigation, but we utilize all of these because each part of the ranch has unique characteristics and needs, and we look more for effective than efficient. So along where we flood irrigate is some of the best spawning grounds in the main stem for Chinook. And it also tends to be accretive to the river, that the river uh, gains about four CFS as it passes through our ranch and drops about four degrees. So we employ a multitude of irrigation methodologies from flood irrigation to overhead sprinklers to what is an item called a K-line. And what we're really trying to do is make sure that we keep vegetation growing on the ranch to fatten the cattle but also to keep the soil healthy. So we manage our cattle for healthy soil, which means we use less water and grow more grass for it. And when you look out, you know, you're gonna see a preponderance of spawning along the edges of ranches that tend to uh, manage their uh, their pastures as such. Yeah, yeah, that's that's helpful. So Damon, so you got this, this setup going on. We have tailings degrading the river. The river's been altered over over the years. It's a different river now. Everybody sees restoration opportunities. Talk a little bit about what Caltrout saw as the opportunity here to work with some of the folks there on the Scott Valley and, and, and really bring in the Yurok tribe and some of their expertise. How did all that come together? Yeah, yeah. This um, So when you take a step back and look at the Scott River, there's you know a history of degradation from different sources. But if you look at you know what is one issue you'd start with and focus on, this mine tailings reach really comes to mind, right? I mean, as you mentioned before, you can see this from space. These mine tailings are something like 30 feet tall, right? And span for something like four and a half miles of river. And it's not just that four and a half miles that's an issue. When our fish are migrating up during drier periods, water goes subsurface there. And so it acts as a fish passage barrier. So they, you know, these anadromous fish can't reach those headwater streams that are in such good condition. Is something like 20% of the anadromous streams are above this. Um, and so there's a kind of a disproportionate impact of that four and a half miles. At the same time, a flood came through and roughly 2015 and damaged uh, water conveyance infrastructure for the farmer's ditch company diversion. And so there was a, a water supply issue that needed to be fixed. And so what, where we came in is, you know, how do we make that conveyance system as fish friendly as possible? Here's an opportunity to rethink how that's going. And then through that period, the Yurok tribe stepped up and said, hey, this is a priority issue. And we had a conversation with Farmer Stitch Company. What do you think about a partnership here? This is this is not a traditional uh, partnership to work together on a project like this. When we brought it to Farmer Stitch Company, we were a little nervous at first, like how is this you know idea gonna go for all three of our organizations to work on this big problem together? And, you know, after, what was it, Gareth, the two and a half hour meeting or something like that, uh, there in City Hall, <laughs> we walked out with uh, full support of meeting with the Yurok tribe. They were 
fully supportive and engaging on this. And an idea was initiated to form this partnership through an MOU that focuses not only on ecological function, but also water supply and the communities there in the Scott Valley. And so that was the initiation of this adventure. Mike, do you want to add to that from your perspective? I'd like to hear from you. Well, you know, uh, I work a lot with uh, Vice Chairman Frankie Myers, who's uh, not only our tribal vice chair, but a, a good friend of mine. I've known Frankie for over 20 years. And we talked about uh, the issues in the Scott. And th the way these issues go is that there's an element of the fish and what the fish need. And that always comes first in our thinking. But in order to get to solutions, we know that we have to work with people. A lot of it's about forming relationships and going and just sitting down with people. And so Farmer's Ditch invited Frankie and his wife, Molly, and myself uh, up to talk with them. And we went over to Gareth's house on a very hot April day. And we sat there in the sun uh, and Preston showed up. Damon, you were there. Um, I can't remember the entire attendance list, but uh, we, we sat in chairs as the sun beat down on us. And the conversation was uh, pretty intense. Uh, you know, I, Frankie laid out a lot of things just in, he was very honest, uh, like Frankie really is. One of the things I really appreciate about him. And, and so was Farmer's Ditch. Uh, and people laid down their um, concerns. They laid down their hopes. They laid down a vision for the future. And as the sun climbed higher in the sky and it just got hotter and hotter, the conversation was so intense, nobody wanted to leave. Nobody called for a break. Nobody said, hey, I need some lemonade right now. Uh, we all just, we just gutted it out and, and nobody wanted to be the one to break. And I, as I recall, maybe it was two hours, but it felt like four. But I recall it was something like four hours we sat out there until finally we called for a break and stepped into the shade and wiped our foreheads. Um, it was an incredibly pivotal day. And at that point, um, you know, my recollection is that, uh, you know, Farmer Stitch said, we, we'd like to form a partnership. And then Frankie said, are you serious? If, cause if you're serious, let's put it in writing and do it with that. If you're really serious about it. And it wasn't very much longer until we were signing a, a very, uh, improbable partnership between, you know, Farmer Stitch, um, uh, Caltrout, Water Trust, and the Yurok Tribe. Um, and in in this MOA that we signed, you know, we agreed to work on common objectives. We agreed to communicate together. Uh, and we, we stated a commitment towards the fish and towards sustainable agriculture in this agreement. And, and the last thing I just want to point out is that, you know, there's a lot of people that have been working on farmer's ditch issues and in their this Watershed Council and Nature Conservancy and other groups. So we knew that we were joining a crowded table at the time. And these are just people that care. Farmer's Ditch, New York Tribe and Caltrout and Water Trust, we also care. And so we have like a lot of people working on this and it's a good thing. Yeah, a lot of, lot of players in there. And, and Damon, before we get to kind of spelling out the project a little bit, you know, Mike, I'd, I'd like to just hear a little bit more about the, the how the tribe talks about it, how the tribe talks about well, let's lay it all on the table. I mean, what are, what are the things that you all are thinking about when you when you decide to embark on on you know what's a pretty unique partnership? What are some of the pushes and pulls? Well, I think you know first and foremost for the tribe, it has to work for fish. You know, partnerships and, and everything they're really important, but if it doesn't work for fish, then it's not going to work for the tribe. Those are the values that the tribe, the tribal council. Uh, stick to. And myself, you know, I, I tend to be a liaison and a coordinator, but ultimately it's the tribal council that decides on policy and partnerships. And so one of the things that's true here, and Gareth, I'd like you to weigh in on this and hear your thoughts on the partnership too, is that, you know, as Damon said, most of the important places for fish in the Scott River are privately owned. And if you don't have uh, cooperation and partnerships with land ownership, you're not getting anywhere with fish restoration. You can do so much in sort of the regulatory realm or litigate or things like that, 
But if you're looking to really help fish and get in there and do something good for fish, then you're going to have to sit down and talk with diverse interests. And luckily, that is a core value of the Yurok tribe and the tribal council. That is something that is really supported. And so that paved the way in order to do this. But again, it if it doesn't work for fish, it doesn't work. And we believe this is going to work for fish or we wouldn't do it. Yeah. And Gareth, yeah, that that's, that's helpful, Mike. And I mean, and Gareth too, I mean, I can imagine, I mean, you're, it's not just you we're talking about as part of this, this, this memorandum of understanding we have. It's a, it's a, it's an entire group of landowners. Maybe give us some insight. That's probably a pretty uh, intense discussion that you're having with your neighbors. People, oh, not at all. Um, you thought it was hot on the deck and the, uh, sitting out there in the direct sun. I think one of the things that it's really important for your listeners to understand, uh, Curtis, um, you know, I'm su- speculating that the group, you know, you've got Caltroud and the Yurok tribe might not necessarily be uh, some of my neighbors necessarily as your first listeners. And I think it's really important to understand just how diverse this group is. I mean, it really is, I'm going to use the term, you know, uh, earth orbit tilting to actually have what you would call historically uh, adverse groups coming together. And at the same time, you know, we're seeing in Siskiyou County, the the new president of the Farm Bureau a couple of years ago saying, hey guys, we're going to stop going toe to toe with the tribes and with Caltrop and the uh, Nature Conservancy, et cetera. We're going to start working with it because litigation hasn't worked. It's not making us more profitable and it sure as heck's not putting more fish back in the river. And I think that lesson and I'm going to be presumptuous here, I think is, is really understood by what I might call the other end of the other side of the aisle. You know, I, I use the analogy of the Middle East and, you know, eight and a half trillion dollars and 23 years of warfare, and that did not bring uh, peace. And I think the same thing, litigation doesn't make fish. I think uh, dinners make fish, uh, spilling beer makes fish, having uh, a friendship and a relationship will make more fish than litigation. And so I think going back to that conversation, I think it's just kind of an awakening for myself and my neighbors to go, well, we can't do this alone anymore. And we sure as heck can't do it fighting. And, you know, when you you talk to people like Vice Chairman uh, Myers, you realize that we probably have a lot more in common with the tribes. You know, we live on the land. We make our living here. We're connected to it often generationally, clearly not to the depth of the tribal relationship. But, you know, it's not, land's not a abstraction to us and what lives on our growth soil. So I think we realize that our a natural partner actually is is probably more on a on a tribal basis than, than other places. And it's a time to time to make uh, great things happen and make us all more uh, brutal. Yeah, that's 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 cool. Well, I appreciate that background. I think these these diverse groups coming together that is that is the headline of this whole thing. One of the reasons I support Cal Trout and love California's rivers so much is because the beauty and the diversity of all of California's endemic trout species. Many thanks to Chris Kirby for that submission. Cal Trout agrees our native fish species are beautiful, resilient creatures, and we work hard every day to ensure they'll be around well into the future. Here at California Trout, our goal is to restore vibrance and abundance to California's freshwater ecosystems and to keep them that way for years to come. With the help of many local and national organizations, we've worked to improve the habitats of several fish species throughout California, and we're just getting started. To learn more about the work we do and what we want to accomplish, visit caltrout.org. That's C-A-L-T-R-O-U-T dot org. Damon, this hot April day, I mean, a lot of discussions after that. Just give us a little sense of what what's the project that we're all rallying around? Yeah, I, th- I think the, you know, the initiation and the foundation of this project is that MOU and that trust that uh, started from the hot deck meeting and built into the signing. These are very important steps in building trust building a relationship, building a foundation that could move us forward in 
a problem that has been here for over a hundred years. Fisheries biologists noticed the river going subsurface in this tailings reach in the 1930s as some of the early accounts that I've found. So this is a problem that's been there for a long time, but is a problem that's so big and socially so complex that we haven't really been able to tackle it. Now what I'm seeing based on this foundation of trust and support from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, we have some meaningful steps towards resolving this in the near future. And what project elements does this not have, right? Like that's what I'm thinking about. It's 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 uh, such a diverse project, includes elements of fish passage, massive habitat restoration, diversion infrastructure reconstruction, on-farm and conveyance, uh, improvements, uh, managed groundwater aquifer recharge, um, and in-stream flow when fish need it. And, you know, just to give you a, a sense of the scale of this restoration, you know, we're, uh, the concepts we're pushing around right now are moving something like 450,000 cubic yards of material um, you know, and just, just to put that in context, like, what is, what is that? You know, it's something like a city block buried with over eight stories of rock. Right. Um, and that's something that the Yurok tribe comes to us with specific expertise in this and is, is helping us take on a problem. That's just like so big that we just haven't had the ability to take it on in the past. And so, um, you know, that, that's kind of, a rough overlay and you know mike uh, you know i hope you can build build on that that uh, picture i just painted of the project yeah i think when i started working for the tribe we had like five fisheries employees and one of the things we realized right away is that putting water into bad habitat is not going to fix the problems whether it's the trinity the main stem klamath the scott the shasta etc you, you can't simply pour water over bad habitat and expect results. You need to be working on both. And so to that end, the tribe began to get involved uh, in restoration activities. We started on Green Diamond land in the lower Klamath. Uh, we are putting roads to bed. We did some in-stream habitat work on Hunter Creek, which is a tributary to the lower Klamath. Um, and we established a restoration branch of the fisheries program. From that, the restoration branch has grown and now is about the same size as the fisheries department itself, uh, which concerns itself more with monitoring and fish science. The restoration program, on the other hand, designs and builds large-scale habitat restoration projects. For example, Oregon Gulch on the Trinity River was a 650,000 cubic yard project that moved the entire Trinity River over to the other side of the valley a reconnected floodplain that was also in a tailings reach, uh, but in a tailings reach where the Trinity flowed year round, but could not connect with its floodplain. And now uh, a modest 18 inch rise of water levels will connect over 50 acres of floodplain now on that river. That project is complete and in the books and we're moving on. So this is what makes us believe that we can handle projects like uh, Farmer's Ditch. Uh, the York Tribes also established its own uh, construction corporation uh, which does a lot of the work, contracts out, and does a lot of the work, and that's owned by the Iraq tribe. We have our own remote sensing uh, that is capable of flying LIDAR and infrared photography, with including our own aircraft. Then all of this is for the fish. That's why the Iraq tribe is doing that. It's for the fish and then for the people that depend on the fish. And channeling my inner Frankie Myers uh, that I know, I hope I have, you know, the keystone species here is humans. That's what we're talking about here. You know, the fish and the people are connected and that goes for a tribe that also goes for ranchers that have that value the fish and know that their livelihoods depend on that too. And I've heard that loud and clear from Gareth and other people up there. And that's what we're doing here. And we're not gonna stop there. You know, the York tribe is also involved in projects uh, on Lower Klamath Lake, uh, Upper Klamath Lake, uh, the Shasta River, uh, we've been doing projects over on the Sacramento side, uh, Clear Clear Creek, and uh, we're just going to keep going. We're just going to restore the climate project by project. But this particular project, which in, which aims to 
reconnect the Scott River with its floodplain, to create floodplain and connect the river with it, and to restore the surface and subsurface hydrology to a state that better passes fish for more times in the year. This is a major project and this is very important to us. It's a very high priority and that's why we targeted it first. It's so impressive to see the Yurok Travel Corporation and the ability that you're talking about to to do big projects like this mining tailings thing, the size and the scale of it sounds like that's been just a daunting aspect of it. But Mike, you're saying, hey, Yurok Tribe's coming in and saying, well, wh- we think we can handle that scale now. Maybe we couldn't 20 years ago, but right now we we think we can. That's pretty cool. And it's and it's really focused on restoring a section of river where the the river goes dry in most years and hopefully as you mentioned bringing that up to the surface and gareth you know it, it was swirling around here is, is all the win-win stuff you know it's like a win for for the fish so talk about what 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 do the farmers get out of this what do the ranchers get out of this so let, let's yeah let's be careful like a lot of people you know look at win-win as skepticism but uh, uh, you know what a good marriage is it's a win-win doesn't mean it's all easy but it's like, it's not you winning every day, Curtis, or Damon, or me, or Mike. It's a win-win. And I think when we approach it like a good marriage, you get that. And I think one of the things that I look at, I would call increased certainty. And so, as I already mentioned, I wasn't born into ranching, but about you know three decade, decades ago, I said, okay, I'm going to ranch. That's how I want to raise my children. I want to have them in an environment that I feel is healthy for them. And you know, it's easy for people to say that regulation is a nightmare and it's overbearing. My background's in, in financial analytics, and I tend to be pretty serious about it. And I spent seven years looking for a ranch and had huge spreadsheets and checked this box and that box. I never, ever imagined that the regulatory burden and oversight would be as egregious, as onerous, and as debilitating as it is. And you know, this is what ranchers are supposed to say, right? We talk about it every day at the coffee shop. You'd be disappointed if I didn't. It is astounding. And one little tidbit I like to point out, any of you that know about the ESA, Endangered Species Act, in 2014, I had 76,300 coho harboring on this ranch during an extreme drought. And that's $1.2 billion of potential take. So you go, well, what's in it for the farmers and ranchers? Who would you like to go to bed at night thinking that you could be uh, held liable for $1.2 billion as a little itty bitty dirt farmer? And so when I started chairing the Watershed Council here about three decades ago, we would bring people up and they'd look at the Scott Valley and all the wonderful restoration work we're doing, they'd get all smiley. And then guess what happened? You know, uh, we're talking about relatives we have, and we all have that one uncle or cousin that's a little bit funny. You take them to the tailings and they all sort of put their head down and go, I'm sorry. So not only is it four and a half miles of dead river, every time there's a high water event, that rock becomes liquid and scours everything below it. So we're trying to farm and raise our families and provide, produce food, all that other wonderful stuff that sounds really good in the the brochures. And then along comes a high water event and destroys the millions of dollars of hours of restoration work we've done below it. So what's in it for me? You know, very simply, being able to go to bed at night and go, wow, I live in a healthy environment and people are happy and I can actually get a good night's sleep. And again, 1.2 billion of potential tape. You know, to put into perspective, the entire regional domestic product of Siskiyou County is under a billion. So for every job and product and service derived, I had liability in excess of that, just as one little simple farmer. So there's a lot. And the last thing I'd say on it, as I told you about my migration as a rancher, The other thing I found out is that when the the healthier the fishery, the fatter and healthier my cattle and the better my profits. So they go together. Healthy soil, good water utilization means a better bottom line. Right. Certainty of water, decreasing litigation liability, health of your land really tied to the health of the water and the whole system. I think that's awesome, Gareth. Well, Damon, I mean, maybe just like stepping back a little bit, just let's, let's put our fish eyes on a little bit. And maybe just kind of get down into the, and Mike, help out with this too, on the the timing of what we're talking about with fish moving through here. I mean, it's such a, it's such an amazing valley. And Damon or Mike, one of you touched on how, you know, we're talking about the main stem, Scott, which has been through a lot. But one of you mentioned 
these tributary streams that are coming out of the Marble Mountain Wilderness, the Russian River Wilderness, th that are in great shape, which is probably one of the main things that keeps this as a coho stronghold in the state. But the trick is getting fish through this section of the main stem and into those tributaries. And that's a lot of what we're talking about here. So, so maybe just somebody put their fish eyes on and come up the river. Talk about timing and where some of these constraints are. Well, one of, one of my favorite days on the Scott River was down there in the lower canyon, um, coming up to the edge of the river and you look down and there's hundreds, literally hundreds of Chinook salmon swirling around. Crystal clear water. They're just sitting there waiting to get up and flows are not sufficient for them to get there. You know, so it just shows the potential that's there you know, to have that ecological function. They're there trying. We just got to get them up there, give them away. When I put my snorkel and mask on, dove in with them, you know, they're healthy as could be. And this is like October, right? I mean, this is like, uh, this is September, October, that time time period. The, the Scott River's rains haven't kicked in. It's still low. These are fish in the Klamath River waiting to come up. That's exactly right. Some of the history relates to this, right? Some of that mining history. When the water hits these mine tailing areas, it just goes subsurface. There's actually reports of fish going through the juvenile fish, not the adults, but the juvenile fish working their way through the subsurface spots between the rocks well you know issues like this are not easy to solve it's not just we need water all the time it's just very specific periods around very specific life history needs where we're in trouble here issues like this are not easy to solve um, with typical restoration approaches and really take a uh, novel thought to come up with well, what are these solutions that can bring that water to the surface bring that connectivity in those real uh, sensitive times. Mike, why don't you jump in here? Well, I always just think about geology being destiny here. And the Scott River has pretty unique geology. It's actually a basin and range created, a uh, fault line created valley that's infilled with gravel from the surrounding mountains. And anytime you have high power, steep tributaries that carry a lot of water that suddenly lose gradient, there's going to be a lot of deposition. In other words, gravel will be deposited. We see this on the lower Klamath in the tributaries like Blue Creek and Turwer Creek and those. And anytime there's a lot of deposition, there could be disconnection. And what's happened as times move forward and agriculture is brought to the basin, the river has been channelized, and we have climate change bearing down on us. We see these things, these disconnections, which used to happen uh, during drought times are more frequent and they last longer. And what we're trying to do here is roll back and have this section of the river, which goes subsurface, uh, not go subsurface as much. So Damon's right, like in the fall, in the fall rains here, there's a time when the river canyon carries enough water to allow the fish to migrate to the upper basin. Uh, that has become more and more tenuous. So the fall Chinook, if they can't get to their spawning grounds because the Canyon's not carrying enough water, then it does. You don't have to have a fisheries degree to understand the implications for the ones in the valley. This project that we're doing is located upriver from the canyon, and is a another blockage that tends to happen. So this is a pretty major area because what this separates the fish from is area of steady cold flow that happens year round, and that is prime for coho rearing, but also Chinook rearing. And that's the part that we're going to be addressing with this. It's a complicated project. It involves adjacent landowners that we're working with. Uh, it involves some complicated interactions between surface and groundwater. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider and we're going through this as carefully as we can and do it working through these issues. Yeah. And, and Mike, you're talking about the, the, the coho have an opportunity to really benefit here. They come in a little bit later than the fall Chinook, November. So the canyon's more apt to be watered. This area then becomes critical for coho, get them in the tributaries. And that's where a lot of these gains can be made. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why we're trying to step through this methodically, use the data, use the data from our partners, 
that, that have developed this data for a long time so that we do this project in a way that benefits fish and we don't have unintended consequences to this. So we're trying to be very conscious and, uh, and oriented towards all the effects of this project. It's inspiring, I think. And I'd like for each of you to kind of, um, you know, take where we are now, take this energy to try to do some cool things. Gareth, let's start with you. So 10 years from now, what, what's happening here? What, what's this place look like? What's going on at your ranch? Well, I better start eating my vitamins so I'll be here, right? No, I think hopefully what's happening at the ranch is that there's a, a thing called, uh, I'm going to use the, that magic word they you know, used to scream in the 60s called peace which means that, you know, we're able to, to ranch and we're, you know, our families are happy and healthy and downriver people are happy and healthy. And what that means is that we've actually made it through these difficult years of instead of blaming. And I think it's something that, you know, really want to share with your, your listeners here, Curtis, is that, you know, this is an incredible start, but it's going to need a lot of support. It's going to need monetary support to make this uh, come to fruition. And more than that, it's going to need a lot of people understanding what is at risk and what are the opportunities and being behind it. So it's not, you know, just send a check $5 to the Watershed Council or to Caltrout. It's really pay attention and go, this is actually one place in our lives where we can actually make a monumental difference that will be recognizable for generations to come. And so, you know, we, we've made great progress. We spent that hot day out on the deck. But we still need to stay together and bring more people into this and understand that, you know, particularly with climate change, that, you know, where we allocate our resources for this to be successful. So in 10 years from now, we're sitting out in that deck and instead of uh, baking, we're having mint juleps and iced tea and celebrating our successes. All right. Mint juleps in 10 years. We, we got that down. That's, that sounds good. And, and I think you're also... I mean, you're also underscoring that this is a precedent thing. This is like setting a setting a way of working as much as it is as doing this project. Um, and maybe Mike, you know, I'll let Damon have the last part of this, but like, tell us, I mean, what do you think? 10 years from now, what's this place look like? What do you hope to achieve? Well, I think, you know, one of the reasons that we value this partnership is that we think we're hoping it can serve as a template so that we can form other partnerships with other landowners there. So what I would like to see in 10 years is that we're working on multiple projects. And, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, give a shout out and some credit to our funders at the state of California uh, for helping us out. They funded this on a design build concept that was a little different than they've ever done before. Um, and so much credit goes to them for having faith in us here. But what I'd envision is in 10 years is that you know, we're working on like possibly phase two of this project. We're working with other farms uh, up and down the Scott River. And that this um, partnership in terms of restoration and cooperation uh, becomes more normal. It's not noteworthy. It's like, oh, yeah, this is what we do. This, this is how we're going to figure out how to live together and have fish and farms at the same time. That's what I see. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's not about finishing the project. It's about a way of a way of working, a way of doing, a way of living. I see this as a beginning, not an ending. But I don't want to have to wait 10 years for a mint julep, Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, the other thing, smokehouses full of salmon downriver. You know, that's that's just, we just can't forget that. Right, Mike. I mean, that, that you know, when when... I think Gareth, you mentioned downriver communities. I mean, what you know, Mike, talk about that a little bit. What what is going on downriver of of the Scott River? Talk about the tribes down there and the importance of these fish. Well, I you know I won't speak for the Crook tribe, our allies and neighbors upriver. Uh, I think you know what people really care about downriver, and I just I'm leaning on my experience. Uh, I'm not Iraq, but I I have been there, worked a long time. People really want the opportunity to fish and they want to put fish in their smokehouses. That's what people want. Um, and so that's what this is all about. You know, we, we talk about partnerships and what we're doing on the Trinity and what we're doing on the Scott. And um, I think what we're really hoping for is that these landscape scale restoration projects like Farmer's Ditch, uh, other projects we're lining up on the Scott River and the Shasta, and then Klamath Dam removal. 
and our work on the Trinity and fixing the main stem Trinity flows all start to interact together. They interact in a way that's more holistic, that's larger than just the sum parts. And we begin to start to restore the resilience, the geographic genetic diversity of the Klamath River. That's, that's what the larger vision is, that this all interacts together. Yeah, and it, it touches on my too. What's what we've talked about a lot with the Klamath Dams is that that's not a silver bullet. It's a big, big step. It's a big, big effort, but it takes these kind of things and the Scott River and the Shasta River and the Trinity and all these that connectivity and that building diversity and resilience, sort of watershed wide, is what it takes. Well, and I, you know, Gareth, I just want to give uh, you a lot of credit for just having the vision, and and uh, I know that it, you know, a lot of your neighbors. We're wondering what the heck you were doing, you know? And so you showed like a lot of courage just sitting out there and, you know, and so did vice chairman. A lot of folks downriver are like, what are you talking with those guys for? Uh, but in the end, I think we have to form these partnerships or we're just gonna watch the fish circle the drain. You know, if we just keep arguing, I think you, you were spot on when you said that, you know, litigation fighting is not gonna create more fish. I agree with that. I think that's that's one of the things I you know what I say and, and again I, I say this humbly and with all respect about similarities that you know we do share and you know when when Frankie is here with with Molly and his children that's us with our children and you know we've all of a sudden instead of it being you know what light years away it's it's our neighbor and that that's a huge difference and, and when they're your neighbors you care absolutely absolutely people living on the land big big part of it. We talk about the uh, fish water people part about the work that we do. And it's the people part that that's often right there at the center of a lot of it. And, and Damon, why don't you send us off with a little bit about what's ahead right now? What happens this year as part of this process? I mean, we've talked about the bigger picture, what we hope to achieve. What happens right now? Where are we at next steps? Yeah, we have a, an, a whole team between the Yurok Tribe, Cal Trout, other NGOs like the Scott River Watershed Council, the Scott River Water Trust, the Nature Conservancy, Resource Conservation Districts, federal biologists and agencies, uh, state agencies, other tribes uh, that have been working in the Scott River for a long time, making a lot of progress for the fisheries and restoration of the drainage. Uh, the Kruk tribe comes to mind as a top participant there. Also, the Quartz Valley tribe has been active in these conversations. And so there's different fisheries programs and environmental programs from each of them helping support these efforts from different angles. We have a whole team working on this issue right now with expertise in hydrology, geomorphology, construction, fish biology. Everybody's focused on this right now. We're at the kind of initial stages of actually designing what's going to be put on the ground and moving in a very tight timeline to get this from concept to construction. This is part of accelerating restoration, and this is an example of it hitting the ground in a very real, in a very large scale way. Um, and so that that's kind of where we're at right now is is uh, putting our heads together or the best approach to take on this this uh, hundred year old problem. Okay, that's great. Hey, and um, Mike and Gareth, Damon and I just really want to thank you for coming on. Thank you for the strong partnership. Thanks for laying it all out there and telling everybody about what's going on. It's really exciting. So I appreciate you spending the time telling us about it. We definitely appreciate the opportunity to share about this beautiful valley and the great opportunities we have. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Thank you, Curtis and Damon. I really appreciate the chance to be on here. And thanks for the Yurok tribe for giving me the opportunity to work for them. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, you all. Caltrout is excited to be a part of this partnership. And for us, it reinforces our commitment to landscape level solutions for all water users across the state, fish and people. We'll be sure to report out as the project progresses, so keep an eye out for updates. Many thanks to Mike Belchek, Gareth Plank, and Damon Goodman for joining us for this conversation, and even larger thanks to them and the many individuals who came together to make this unique partnership possible. And as always, thanks to Wilco for the theme music. 
I'm Curtis Knight, Executive Director of California Trout and your host of the Fishwater People podcast. This episode was written, produced, and engineered by Bridget Shaw and Drew Alvarez of Pusher Media on the banks of the Sacramento River in the historic train and trout town of Dunsmere, California.